The, the sort of initial impetus for Nerve or the, the inspiration was coming from a lot of electronic music culture and dance culture and you know Jojo sort of becoming obsessed with those beats put together sort of started the band out of throwing parties in New York so it really started as kind of like a, an underground party band where he would make these events and have DJs and people coming down and jamming and um, eventually over the years it kind of solidified into a a pretty stable lineup with some changes here and there over the years, but um, it's remained like a, a pretty loose and uh, loosely structured organization, but but very compact. You know, we deal with all the logistics ourselves, um, and we like to be able to go anywhere and do as good of a show as possible. So when we're touring, we usually bring with us a an Allen Heath Q24 console. Um, that's Ethernet to the stage box on stage. What was the name of that? AR2412. Okay, AR2412. And then um, on stage, that also connects to the musicians' personal mixes. We have three ME1s on stage so they can make their own personal monitor mixes. Uh, working with Nova is, is a very interesting challenge um, to run in front of house and, uh, and be in sort of interactive um, role I play with the band. Um, Number one, the sort of the sounds that the band is searching for um, are quite unusual and the sounds that John uses on the bass and the sounds that Jacob's using on the keyboards and Jojo's drum kit is a very unusual setup. So obviously the first challenge is trying to reproduce the sounds that they're creating and get them to carry over into an audience setting and make it exciting and fun and hopefully, you know, a lot of the time it should feel like a party or a dance club. So, you know, those are some of the challenges and then there's also the aesthetic challenge of trying to take music that's played by three live musicians and make it sound somewhat like an electronic music style while trying to keep this improvised nature and the spontaneity that happens on stage with three people. Um, so part of my role is to really color up what they're doing and give the audience an experience that feels more like a record. And obviously I can't do that much live, you know, I'm still dealing with an acoustic drum kit, but I can, you know, do various dubs and change the sounds on the fly and I feel like that's a really important part of the sound of the band is to be able to uh, give the audience an ever-changing experience sonically um, which is a, very much an, uh, an electronic music style rather than something like jazz where it's a very static sonic experience um, and the excitement is based on another in another form um, so with that being said you know we John did a bunch of research we started talking after a certain tour where we were dealing with Con, you know, a bunch of other consoles, and he started researching consoles and in-ear systems as well. Yeah, I think it, I think it really started from the in-ears and 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 looking for like, okay, you know, we just have to like find a solution for this. We would have like four-hour sound checks, five-hour sound checks, you yeah. know, and and a lot of the stuff we do, both what Aaron does at front of house with the real-time manipulating and sampling. I mean, he didn't get into that, but you know, he does. He can grab anything we're doing and he can loop it and chop it up and spit it back at us. And we also are sending audio, you know, we're sending the kick drum to a sidechain input on Jacob's keyboard so he can have real-time sidechaining or gating off the kick. And then we're also sending audio up to the stage to a delay that the drummer, Jojo, can control. So, you know, it's not that complicated if you, if you know what you're doing, but when you walk into a theater in Chengdu, China, and you try and explain to like the house guy who doesn't even really know how to run the system, like, okay, well, it's cool, we need two of the auxes have to terminate in male XLRs on stage, and then we have to have, you know, and you just get these blank looks, and we're just like, oh my god, like, we have to, we have to be self-contained, because what we do is not that difficult, but it's unusual, you know, so that kind of led us, that and the wanting to go to all in-ears led us to like, okay, well, if we could just bring our own system and we could be totally self-contained, then, you know, we could have 20 minute sound checks. And then, you know, we kind of were doing research and found the QU and also saw like that it, you know, was a direct recording interface and we were like, well, now we can record every show too, because that was always something we had wished we could do due to the sort of improvised nature and the importance of the live experience. It was sort of like, wow, now we can actually, you know, capture what we do and in, in an incredible quality every night. 
And I think it's kind of funny because originally the QU was going to be just a monitor desk for us. Oh, yeah, originally we thought yeah. of just buying it as a monitor desk and we were like, oh, well, let's try it out. Yeah. And so <laughs> like, the minute we were, and you know, usually, you know, originally Nerve and the previous front of house engineer who was very integral in the, the development of Nerve, um, you know, he was very much an analog desk guy and I'm, I come from an analog world as well and usually I'm like, I never want to work on digital consoles, you know, at the studio we work on Neves and SSLs and that's where we live 90% of the time, but just the sheer practicality of having a digital console and having a digital console that you can use the same console every night means that you find a way to get around it really quickly and some of those limitations of not having every knob in front of you at every moment become a less lesser issue and you instead trade the convenience of having any monitors, short sound checks, recallable and being able to, to yeah. record all the time. Just all of a sudden it was like this makes so much sense. We can take this console with us and it's gonna make our lives much easier. The sound of the ME1 is pretty amazing. I mean, usually with most digital or Ethernet-based um, Q systems or monitoring systems, you know, usually the convenience is the only thing you gain from it. They usually sound pretty terrible. Um, and, you know, we went out on a limb and a little bit of a risk when we bought these because we hadn't heard them, but all the specs on it and, and what you could do, it seemed kind of like a no-brainer. And I remember the first time I set it up in the studio, I was just listening, I was playing back some live tracks just to switch the QD24 into, you know, playback mode. And, and was just setting it up and I couldn't believe like how just how good it sounded as a mixer. You know, it was like, oh this is gonna be this is gonna be great. You know, I could hear the mics from a show recorded through the console and I was like, oh this is exactly what it's gonna sound like. And so that was the first thing that was probably, you know, really exciting for us. It's not just that we're gonna have a be able to have custom mixes, but we're gonna have mixes that actually sound really nice. Um, and then after that I think just the the flexibility of having access to 40 channels of audio and being able to build exactly what you need is just, you know, pretty astounding. I mean, to have a 40-channel digital console that's this big is, you know, kind of unheard of. And, uh, you know, I think that's that's being able to set each one up for what each player needs has been the, the great thing. Like, you know, JoJo has all of the drums, the different parts of the drum kit split out on different knobs, and then he's got all the keyboards on one knob, and, you know, Jacob has vice versa. He's got all his keyboards and his effects fanned out on the bottom eight. And so then he's got a lot more control over that, you know, and I just turned them all down. <laughs>